You know, I believe every person in every house that I came in contact with was left with the little Lord Jesus. Psalms 46, 11 said, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. A few days back, I was leaving one of those houses that was in trouble. Uh, their air was out and it was late at night and uh, they called and I went. And I took the whole family and sometimes they like to ride along. And so we went to that house. Uh, we got the air temporarily fixed for that moment and then we headed back home. We was headed down I-35 and it was dark. And as we were driving back home, an object was hit on the side of the road, which was a tire. And that tire was struck and it came up off the ground. And because it's so dark in that area where I was in, that tire, at the last minute, I saw it coming towards the windshield. And I tell you, as I sit back and I think about that moment, how God helps us, how His every every present help is there with us in our time of trouble. So as we're driving, I see this object coming towards the windshield, and at a moment's notice, it shifted course. How many of us in our lives have been shifted because of God's ever present help? Amen. So this morning, as our lives have been shifted through this pandemic, but now we're able to get back here in this place and worship our God again. As you begin to give this morning, I want you to know that God is ever present in your time of trouble. Even though the world may be in a pandemic, we're not. Because we're God's children. We're not in a pandemic. Because God is in a right way. So as the ushers come, if you have your time and offer this morning, just slip your hand up. We can give some things to you. So Father God, we just thank you, God. We thank you for your ever presence, God. Your ever present help, God. For never failing us, God. For always having our backs, God. We thank you, Lord. God, we trust you with our lives, with our children's lives, God, with our neighbors' lives, with our friends' lives, God. And so as we begin to worship you today this morning, God, just give us a fresh new anointing, God. Give us a fresh new anointing, God. Father, we love you, we trust you.
to honor the men and women who have died while in military service of the United States of America. We're grateful for their sacrifice. We're thankful for the freedoms that we enjoy. If you have a member, a family member who paid that ultimate price and, and gave their life in that way, would you stand and let us honor them through you? It's okay, stand. If you would honor your loved one, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because those things matter. They still matter. Thank you. You can be seeing. And I'm not, I'm not confusing more from World Day and Veterans Day, but which Veterans Day is to honor all who have served. But I really would like to just take this opportunity to honor those here today who have served in the military or maybe currently are. Would you stand and let us do that for you? Again, I'm, I'm not confusing the days, but I want to give on to where the honor is due. It's not a small thing, guys. Thank you, men and women, for being in this room. We acknowledge you. Thank you, thank you for that. I, I, with every election, we need to remember whether they're local elections, state elections, national elections, we need to remember and not give away our freedoms that these and your loved ones have fought to protect. I need to, I, 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 let me just remind you of something. This church votes. This church votes. And uh, if you're not registered, you've got to do that first. Uh, but uh, we not only expect every member to vote, we want us to vote in an informed fashion so that we can vote biblically. So we will not be silent on issues over these next months even, and we generally aren't anyway. We just want you to be informed in a culture that is, has, can, can go some really weird ways and anyway. I, I, I'm just glad that we are cognizant of those responsibilities. There's a stewardship that we have. I had a friend who's a pastor, uh, his pastor from a number of years, he actually over, uh, partners with a lot of other pastors now, and he had a revelation as he dropped his son off, I think took the oath to be in the Marine Corps uh, some years ago. He went, what, what am I willing to sacrifice my son for? <clears throat> I put it on a whole different level. There's some things I'm willing to sacrifice for, but one of my kids, my son, my daughters, and, and it, it, it just stopped uh, there. And realizing our stewardship responsibility, I didn't mean to talk so long, but I'm just telling you, in, in our nation, we are to steward our freedoms. We're to steward we have uh, in a, a republic that we have. I mean, for those of you that are Texas, I don't mean the Republic of Texas, I mean, the United States. But that together, uh, we will, we will uh, honor God, both in our lives, and our voting, and our influence. Amen. Amen. But what the message this morning is, uh, I'm not sure if some other things have come up or I'm overlooking somebody. I, I, I particularly and especially uh, want to honor somebody else today. That's Dr. Teresa Lawson. Uh, where are you? She served as our pastor of ministry and development here at Open Door for the past two and a half years or so. Uh, an amazing gift of God to us to Open Door. She has worked diligently with both anointing and skill, has established and set in order much of the structure of the systems that are now in place at Open Door in order to position us to continue to move forward and to grow. But as many of you have already heard, Pastor Teresa has sensed that the Lord's call for a transition in this season for her. So although she's stepping back as staff pastor, she'll still be on our preaching, teaching team, our prayer team, other volunteer roles as she advanced, continued to serve the Lord here at Open Door. But I not only wanted to tell you about the transition, but I also wanted to publicly express our love and our respect for this great couple, not only for me and Pastor Kim, but also from the rest of this church staff and the leaders of this congregation, and I think this congregation. Would you cheer that yes.
Again, we love you guys. Romans chapter 13 says, Be honored who honor is due, and we honor y'all. Thank you for your, your strength and your setting in order things here. I, I, I have a, a message I feel like the Lord wants me to share this morning. I'll try to be brief. Uh, when I say that, I always feel like my integrity is in question. I saw that. Don't look at me with that tone of voice. I, Listen, let me, let me read a couple of paragraphs that I believe will, will help illustrate something we want to go toward this morning. A visitor to the world headquarters of a major corporation was ushered into the office of the company's founder and, and CEO. The guests marveled at the magnificent view from that window, the expensive works of art on the walls and the plush furniture in the room where the men worked. One detail, though, seemed to be out of place. It's prominently located on the executive's finely polished mahogany desk was a dusty-looking, dirty black rock. Noticing the visitor's curiosity about the successful businessman explained, that's a lump of coal. I keep it here to remind me of my roots. It came from the coal mine where my father worked for 45 years. I never want to forget that I am where I am today because of where he was when I was a boy. Amen. And see, in a, in a sense, for this man, this lump of coal served as sort of a memorial. And, I, and, and doing a little research building toward this message this morning, I found in Scripture that word memorial is used in over 30 passages of Scripture, 30 places. Sometimes it's used referring to a... Uh, a place. Sometimes it refers to a feast day. Sometimes it refers to something that's written in a, a book as a memorial. Sometimes it is prayers and offerings that have gone up that have served as a memorial. Sometimes it was referred to in scripture as an event we told. This woman with the poured out oil said this will be told as a memorial to her all and all, for future generations. And sometimes it refers even to uh, offerings and sacrifices that were yet given. This morning I want to talk for a few minutes about setting up memorial stones in our own lives. Setting up memorial stones. And I want us to look back together at a place in the Bible where God told some of his followers to specifically build a memorial of stones to remind them of God's faithfulness and of his blessing. Let's give the backdrop of this so that we can launch from here and how it applies to our own lives. The Israelites had just followed over, crossed over the Jordan River into their promised land and into the place of their inheritance. They had begun to, to go that way. We'll look at Joshua chapter 4. We'll read uh, uh, eight verses here. When all the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Now choose twelve men, one from each tribe. Tell them, take twelve stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan. Carry them out and pile them up at a place where you'll camp tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had chosen, one from each of the tribes of Israel. He told them, go into the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark of the Lord your God. Each one of you must pick up one stone, carry it on your shoulder, twelve stones in all, one for each of the twelve tribes of Israel. We will use these stones to build up memorial. In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? Then you can tell them they remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the ark of the Lord's covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. So the men did as Joshua had commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, one for each tribe, just as the Lord had told Joshua. They carried them to the place where they camped for the night and constructed the memorial there. Several things that we can talk about right there. I, I love that, that observation. That in the future, when your children say, ask you, what do these stones mean? You're able to tell them. See, I want to encourage each of us as God answers prayers. Or he makes provision. Or as Kendall mentioned, he helps avoid something in the middle of what could have been disaster. He sets that up. 
that we write those things down. Maybe for, for me, sometimes I'll write in the back or the front cover of my Bible. You can write testimonies. You can write dates or events. And you go back and use those things to encourage yourself in the Lord. You can encourage other people in your life too, reminding each one of us of the faithfulness of God. Do you have any of those stories? I'm not going to have you share them right now. Do you have some of those? Can I hear an amen? Here in, in the past when our children were younger and at home, there were things, events that had happened where we just watched God marvelously move, meeting a need or doing something great. Which, by the way, is God's nature to do anyway. <laughs> See, we would get our family, my wife, children in the living room, and we'd say, look what God has done. And then we'd talk about it, and we'd thank God for it. But what are we doing when we do that? What are you doing when you do that with your family? In a sense, we're stacking up memorial stones. We're, we're putting some things in remembrance. And what I want to do this morning is that as we look back at these Israelites, it's, we see how they got to that point so they could build a memorial to the great things God had done. What, what were the steps taken? What application does it have for, for me, for you, for our families? Here's an important perspective, I think, to keep in mind as we look at constructing memorials, as we're declaring our testimonies of what the Lord has done. Realize that this type, this type of memorial marker is not a tombstone or a marker of what God used to do that he doesn't do anymore. It's not history of a dead God. Huh. So it's rather, it's a memorial marker to the greatness of the God who still is. Can I hear a witness in the house? Absolutely. I'm looking at five things this morning, some memorial markers to set up because God's still working. These five things this morning that will help us to blaze the trail for others to possess their inheritance as well. Realize this, this first one is not some great surprise revelation. Number one is realize the problems will come. You say, no, no, I, I get that. I'm in the middle of something right now. Listen, I'm not trying to prophesy your future being problematic. Actually, Jesus already said some things about that, a familiar passage with promise. John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me, Jesus said, you'll have what? Peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. That's a good word. Uh, the, the situation of trouble sandwiched between the promises of God. Isn't that cool? Obviously, some of the problems that come against us are those problems that are beyond our control. There are certainly problems that come that that you've had no hand in creating, yet they still come. Look at this type of problem with these people that are on their way to their promised land. Joshua chapter 3, verse 1. Early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left Akasia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River, where they camped before crossing. So the people, verse 14, so the people left their camp to cross the Jordan, and the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Look at verse 15. It was the harvest season, listen, and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. Somebody say, problem? See, problem was right there. The Israelites, as they stood at the Jordan River, it says the river was at, at flood stage. Essentially, it was blocking them off from what God said belonged to them. And yet God had given them instructions about crossing over. Can you hear the reasoning that probably was going on in their minds since that kind of reasoning goes on in ours too? But God, how can we do what you told us to do? We can't cross over. We've got this huge problem in front of us called a Jordan River flood stage prohibiting us. What problems uh, seem to be arising in front of you today keeping you from going and doing what God said to do? Maybe for us, our, our problem looks like, well, God, I can't, I can't really deal with it. See, I have a shy personality. I'm just not turned to be outgoing that way. Or maybe it's a problem that rises up in our, our the everyday of our life. God, I can't seem to really be Holy Spirit control. See, all my family has a history of bad temper. Don't look at somebody. 
She said, oh, it's my, it's, it's my Irish, it's my German, it's my red hair, whatever. Uh, instead of maybe us throwing up some excuses right there, maybe we just need to be honest with ourselves and, and with God. God, it's probably really my life to surrender to you that keeps me from victory in some area. Instead of declaring our excuses, maybe I should be declaring my new heritage in Him, my lineage, my new DNA. Uh, I like what somebody defined DNA as, it's not the medical scientific name, but divine nature attributes. That's what we receive, the, Lord, the power and strength of God. When these Israelites stood in front of the flooding Jordan River, and, and what was staring them in the face, we could label impossibility. That was really an opportunity for them to be paralyzed by fear and be embraced by unbelief. It, it surely had to be a temptation, as it is with us, to look at the greatness of our problem when really what we need to be doing is turning, as mentioned this morning, our focus toward the greatness of our God. When our problem screams, look at me, look at me, look at me, let's look to God instead. See the greatness of our God in the midst of our problem that may be having a label attached to it called impossible. Look at what Jesus said in Luke 18, verse 27. I want you to read this out loud with me, if you will. He replied, what is impossible for people is possible with God. Problems will come. Some problems come in their demonic setups. They're actually, some problems come to detour us from the very will of God. And we need to recognize those things from, for what they are. But already make an advanced decision that you will not throw up your hands and quit. And you will not be diverted from the will of God because of problems. Amen. And these Israelites are looking at an insurmountable problem over which they have no control. Don't have the ability to change it. But there is some additional instructions from the Lord. Second principle, number two, is determined to push instead of part. When we come up to the, to the problem, when we come up to the impasse, determine not to just part there. Look at what Joshua 3 at. God's going to give them some very specific instructions. Do you know that God cares about the problem that you're standing in front of? And God has instructions of how we can take steps here. But part of our responsibility is that we determine not to just part there. But we say we will go forward in God's instruction. We will push forward if need be. Joshua 3, I give them this command. Give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take, some, take a few steps into the river. And stop there. And these priests that were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, they could not afford to be passive right there. God told them, actually told them two things. He said, go and put your feet in the water. Now let me pause there for just a minute. As they're obeying God's word, it doesn't, it doesn't say, so the priests went and put their ski vest on just in case. I mean, the river at flood stage, when we have a lot of rain, we see the Brazos River and stuff, see stuff floating down, we see the water running at a lot higher rate of speed than it, if it's been in a dry season. It, it, it doesn't say that these guys just were so anxious or even so fearful that they would come and guard themselves. But God said, I want you to go and put your feet in the water. It does not say that these guys were just thrill seekers either. They were adrenaline junkies, and I just want to get out on the edge and do whatever. No, no. They were walking in obedience to God. That key is very important to us. I, but the, because when God said, I, I, I've not seen this before studying for this today, but it says in verse 8, take a few steps, say that with me, take a few steps into the river and what? And stop there. Oh, God, I got a good plan. I, I can. Ooh, I think I can hit this thing running enough and I've got another strategy. Sometimes it's as important to know to stop as it is to take steps. Take steps and stop. I have a tendency. Ah, oh, do I even need to confess this? Y'all already know it. So when words start coming out of my mouth, I don't always know when to stop. 
Don't we? Look, I know some of you identify with that. You just want to be honest on a Sunday morning. But if I need to know when to pull back. We need to know because we can. I'm, some of you are, your minds work at such a fast rate of speed, you're already lots of steps ahead and we're, okay, God, if I can do that, and, then, 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 and you're out here and God said, take a few steps and stop. 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 Okay. Maybe it's going to help somebody because don't, don't rush ahead of God. It, it's for some, uh, they, people have gotten you know, weird ideas. They, they, okay, well, God's sovereign. So since God is sovereign and, and overarching control of the events that happen on the earth, and I'm, I'm not negating the sovereignty of God, but He also gives us a free will. Can I hear one amen out right there? He gives us a, a responsibility on our part. For some that might say, well, if God wants me to have a godly atmosphere in my house, He'll just blow my TV up and so on all the time. He'll just make me pray. He'll just make me read the Bible. He probably won't do that. There are times that you've just got to push instead of park when those situations are there. If we're going to ever get over to the great things God has for us, somebody say push instead of park. See, Paul tells younger Pastor Timothy something about the necessity of this pushing instead of parking. First Timothy 6, 12, he told Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Fight is not a passive word. Now, let me clarify this. He does not mean fight other church members. It doesn't mean fight your pastor, fight your neighbor, fight your mother-in-law. Hmm. No, fight spiritual opposition. Fight discouragement. Fight laziness. Fight an attitude of discontentment that wants to roll over in us and be rehearsed in us. Fight the good fight of faith. The second part of that verse, lay hold on eternal life to which you are called. See, if you receive Jesus, you've been born again, and in some way you had the impression that you were just going to live a, in a perfectly ordered world with no problems or difficulties since Jesus lives in your heart and mind, uh, and that you could just coast into heaven, alarm, and a little false advertising that's probably happened to you. You don't have a, an opportunity to quit now. I just want you to go forward and understand there's a fight involved. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold uh, on eternal life to which you're also called. Uh, don't let your spiritual transmission slip into neutral. I've said this once before, but long ago in my truck driving days, I remember I was heading back to Waco late one afternoon and I think I had Christian music or some preaching going. That's so long ago it was in the age of cassette tapes at some point. And at a certain point, the sun is, is uh, you know, going, it's in the afternoon, I come in and I, I realize when the trucks were governed at a certain about 62 miles an hour or so, and as I'm driving along and the motor and, and whatever, and my mind was a little bit disconnected, I'm sure, and uh, I, I realize, I, I glanced at my speedometer, and I think I was going like 40 something. But the, the sound was the same. The engine was revved at the same. RPMs, all this. I looked and realized my, my gear shift had slipped out. And I'm, I'm a, can I just say that? Sometimes it just, we've been humming along. We got in a routine in our spiritual life. Instead of going 62, we're going 35. And because our transmission kind of slipped over into neutral. I just encourage you, put your clutch in, get it back in gear, and let's go forward. Fight the good fight of faith. Amen. We will not stop where we are, but we will go forward, and then when God says, okay, take a few steps, pause. Look at principle number three. is position ourselves properly. Positioning ourselves properly is a crucial part in the journey. It doesn't look the same for everybody. It's not the same set of circumstances. Let's see what these priests did. These Old Testament priests uh, were to it wasn't enough for them to just walk out and stand in the water. They were moving into position. Significant part, I, I passed over that a, moment, a few moments ago, but they were carrying something on their shoulders, that thing called the Ark of the Covenant. And we talked about that last week and, uh, in more detail. And uh, again, if you missed last Sunday's sermon, sermon, let me help you understand. This Ark of the Covenant was a gold-covered box 
that contained was the visual representation of the presence of God in the earth. Inside, as we mentioned then, were the, the stone tablets that God had written the Ten Commandments on, the pot of manna, the Aaron's rod that budded, and all that stuff. The ark was representative of the presence of God and the promises of God and the covenant of God, the principles and, and the provision of God. So uh, uh, as these guys are coming in, where are they in relationship to those things that I just said? The Ark of the Covenant? They were under them. Let me, let me see the rich symbolism of this. In other words, they were subordinate, subjected to the presence of God and the Word of God. It's not enough that they just were visually in a place. They had to be in the place under God's authority. Carrying his promises, carrying his principles. We've got to be positioned to in an area in a in a proper relationship of obedience to God. Not by our own ability. Again, as we talked about earlier, it's the grace of God inside of us that's, that's enabling us, positioning us to walk under his authority. Even in in the face of adversity, even when my flesh wants to go a different way than God wants to go with that, we will choose to be properly positioned under the authority of God. And that needs to be demonstrated by our lives. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus kind of emphasized this really strongly. He said, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. We will choose our positioning, either rejecting God's authority or coming under obedience to it. Can I hear one more amen? I gotta move on. Another aspect to help these Israelites as they're about to cross over, something that these priests really had to take hold of, number four, is we must persevere beyond what we see. We must often persevere beyond what's visible. This uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, many of you can quote this. For we walk by faith, say the rest of it with it, not by sight, not by feelings, not by emotion, not by the latest group thing, but by faith, which is simply again choosing to walk in obedience to God. We need realize though that often God's, God moves in a way that's not immediately seen. Walking in obedience and walking in faith does not always release immediate results that we can feel, see, know. Huh. Look at this as it is exactly out with these Old Testament priests carrying the ark of the presence of God, walking in obedience to God. Verse 15 of Joshua chapter 3. But as soon as the feet of the priests were carry, who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above that point began backing up at a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarethan. And the water below that point flowed on to the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. And now stay with me for just a few more minutes. The city of Adam, geographically, they tell me historically, was located about 19 miles upstream of the Jordan from where these priests were then standing in the water. It would seem that even though the water was stopped from flowing 19 miles up, up its course, it would take a while for 19 miles worth of water to empty itself when it's cut off that far upstream. Does that make sense to y'all too? It's seen cut off up there. So you see these priests that had to go in and stand in what was initially a raging river and when they wouldn't see immediate change because it's still flowing. The river still, some of you have been there. Some of you are there right now. You see, God, I chose to walk this in obedience to you. And you still feel the water rushing at your feet. You still feel the emotions that you had of concern. And, ah, what, is, is anything happening? Sometimes what God is doing is beyond our ability to see. See, when we pray and we obey, I want to tell you, child of God, just go ahead and keep standing with faith in God. Pray, obey, keep standing with faith in God. When your feelings don't change, when you can immediately see doesn't change, uh, still stay standing. Look at what happened 
as these priests stayed and standing where they were. Verse 17. Then the priest who, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. Stood firm. It means to be established, stable, enduring, to be settled. See, if they were moved and directed by just what they saw or felt, they would have felt like, well, you know what, that just didn't work. Let's, let's do something else. And there will be times that we feel that way if we're honest with ourselves. There's some that may have had feelings of, even during this, this change of routine, may have feel like, you know what, I think I'm going to go get high. I'm going to go drink some alcohol. I'm going to go do something else. No, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. Stand firm. Look what happened. Look at that verse one more time. Those who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on what kind of ground? Was this dry ground when they put their feet on it? No. If they were in a river at flood stage, walking over into it. And what God, I believe what the Lord would show us if we will persevere beyond what we feel and beyond what we see, then God knows how to take care of the ground that's under our feet. And I hear one witness in the house. You've been there and you already know that. Last point that I want to share this morning, number five, is there are others who are depending on you. There are others that are depending on you. Hmm. No longer is this just about us. See, you're pressing on, you're positioning. Your persevering is not just about you. It's about others that are depending on you. I can say it this way. Your posterity, that means future generations are depending on you. There are those who are watching us. There are those who, with whom we have influence that are depending on us. Joshua 3, 17. Let's read the rest of that verse. Meanwhile, the priests were carrying the ark of the Lord's covenant. They stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. They waited there until the whole nation of Israel had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Approximately one and a half to six million Jews, Israelites, crossed over that day. Know that as you stand firm in the covenant of God, as you possess what God has for you to possess, as you reject compromise and you reject backsliding, that you're creating a way for others to still go forward and to possess their inheritance of God. In God also can I hear a witness. I'm so thankful for others that have gone before me that held the door open so that we can go, huh, go forward in the, tr the trail that they've already blazed. Keep the door open for somebody else to walk through. There's some, there's some grandparents in here. Keep the door open for your kids and grandkids. There are parents in here. There are single men and women in here. They don't have kids, but there are people that are watching you. They may not say, I'm watching your life. They work on the job with you every day. There may be other people that they know what past you came out of it. They're still in it, and they're watching. Because if this doesn't work for you, why would they take a chance? But as you stand firm, God is making the ground dry and solid underneath you. You're saying, come on in. Come on over. God's got something else for you. So don't park again where you are. We walk on being a gate opener for somebody else. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all what? The source of all comfort. I, I go back to this scripture a lot because I just see the duplication of it. It just speaks to my heart. The source of all comfort, verse 4, here's, here's our responsibility of transfer, of leaving the door open for others. Verse 4, read it out loud with me if you will. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others when they are troubled we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. There's an old song a uh, precious sister used to sing. said, I've been through enough to know he'll be enough for me. I remember that song. I've been through enough to know he'll be enough for me. I'll walk through some of that. We need to understand there would never have been a way for these Israelites 
to build the memorial stones on that side, the promised land side of the Jordan, if somebody hadn't stepped out into the water, if somebody hadn't been in right position under God's authority, if somebody hadn't been willing to persevere, stand when they couldn't see something happening upstream, if some people hadn't been in a place for others to look at their testimony, I just feel like I need to rivet in on that point for just another moment. You are being watched. And on your worst day, when you feel the most discouraged, you think, you know what? I think I'm just going to back up spiritually. Remember, somebody's watching you. Oh, they may not have insight to all your thoughts, all that, but they're watching you. You're going to be an encouragement to somebody else. Some of you walk through some crazy difficult times. But because we've seen you walk through, and when crazy difficult times are hitting us, we also say, God, you're enough. You're enough. They did that. I'm so proud of you guys. Many of you have been on the journey a while. Some of you it's a shorter while, but I'm proud of what I've seen the Lord do. Pick it up, pick it up. Solidifying the muddy, slippy, slippery ground, the sloppy ground that you used to be standing on is solidifying. You've got to walk with God that you're growing in. Now, now you're in a position. Hold the door open for somebody else. Hold the passageway open for somebody else. As I'm closing, I'm about to close. God has called us to really build a, a, a physical memorial stones out in the parking lot somewhere here. If he does, we, we choose to do that. But he has he, he had called us to erect a granite marker or something or even a building that some ornate cathedral like that. But God has called us each to live our lives as memorial stones for somebody else is looking. One last scripture, First Peter 2, verse 5. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. On this Memorial Day weekend, let Him start building in us more memorial stones. Whatever memorials or legacies or reputations that we Built without him, they're not going to last. Maybe, maybe all the memorial that we've built in our past, in our past, has been an obvious mess. One that we wouldn't really want anybody else to duplicate or follow. But today it can be turned around. We're going to let Jesus do a lasting work in us. As Peter, as he spoke through Peter, to build us up into a spiritual house, holy priesthood unto him. Today, some of you might be just facing some problems that are so incredibly tough. The issues seem too great. The barriers seem too large for me to, for you to ever get to what God has for your future. With God, all things are possible. I, I so appreciate it. I think it's in Mark, maybe 9. If it's not there, it's somewhere else in the Bible. That's what, but the man said, Lord, I believe. Help my, my unbelief. I'm there at times. What I believe, uh, help for unbelief tries to crowd that out and set me down. Just keep keep doing what's in front of you, going what's right. These principles that we talked about this morning. I want to make sure that all in this room and all that are watching online, you take giving up out of your list of options. I'm going on with God. We'll not by the power of the grace of God at work. He's called you to go over and possess your inheritance in Him. Spiritual life, peace, kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that walking in the power of His kingdom now. Let's start setting up some memorial stones today. I want you to bow your hearts together with me for a few moments. Today, 
For some of you, it's a day of establishing this memorial stone of who you're going to serve. We're all going to serve somebody, serve ourselves, which is really independence from God declaring, and we'll wind up serving the devil. All the other choices will serve and bow our knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is that day of decision. We established before heaven and hell marker stone. And one really today, Deuteronomy 30, God said, I, I call heaven and earth to witness today. I said before you life and death, blessing and cursing, choose life, he says, so that you and your descendants, see that's that legacy, that's that inheritance, so that you and your descendants can live. We will not stop Oh, Lord, would you help each one in this place, each one watching online, that we may begin this day at a new level of surrender. Let you build in and through us memorial markers, not to a dead event of something in the past, but a marker that points to a living God, to who you are, oh, Lord, in the name of Jesus. You're here today, you're watching online, or watching online, and you're not yet let Jesus have real ownership of your heart and life. Here's the time of decision. Jesus' command was come to Him. In our coming to Him, there's an acknowledgement of His rightful ownership over us. But again, He doesn't force anybody to serve because of the choice thing. He that believes will have eternal life. Not a mental ascent, only but believing what Jesus did on the cross. He took our place for our rebellion and sin against God. Our nature that was set against the things of God. Jesus said, we can be born again, made new from the inside out. Today is your day. Even as you're sitting in this room, if you're here today, you say, today I want to let Jesus be Lord and Savior over my life. Well, eyes are closed. I just want you to raise your hand up. Let me acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. For some of you, it started over. And one time, maybe you were that, that one about to walk into the river saying, I'm going forward. These things happen. You were about to press through some problems, but you got converted. Today, you said, I'm going to start again. Start for the very first time. I'm over. So let me see your hand, would you? I'll do this with a thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Lots of hands up in the room. Thank you. I want you to, you can put your hands down. This is what I'd like for you to do. I'm going to lead in a prayer. It's not the only prayer you can pray. It's just a biblical setting of, of a proclamation of the beginning. And I want us to, we can pray together in this room. Pray that to me. Lord Jesus, I come to you. I am through with running from you. I acknowledge that without you I am a sinner. I'm lost. But today I repent of my sins. And I thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross. Taking the penalty for my sins. And that you rose from the dead. Show them that the Father accepted that sacrifice. So today I open the door of my heart. I submit my free will to you. And I give you authority in my life. Cleanse me and forgive me. Wash me and change me. Thank you for cleansing my past. And for beginning setting in order for my present and future to honor you. I welcome you, Holy Spirit. I confess Jesus that you're my Lord and my Savior. And by your power, I choose to live for you the rest of my life and into eternity with you. Thank you for your love. 
Thank you for new beginnings today. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's give God praise in this house. We can thank you. A number of you raise your hands about praying that and making that new beginning. There are prayer partners that are just, if you'll slip your hand back up, you pray that prayer, you meant it, over in the overflow, over in the middle, or over on the sides. Raise your hand back up. If you want to pray, make sure that you have some follow-up material that's going to help you on these first steps. Prayer partners are just going to come to where you are. Slip your hand up. They'll, they'll, with distancing respect, honor you. But I want you to secure this moment today. Raise your hand. Let them get to where you are. And then we're going to have worship team come back. We're going to celebrate and close it because God's a good God. There's a possession to be possessed. And until he comes and takes us out of this world, then we're going to walk on in an inheritance that he has in this present world as well. Being there for others, marching toward their inheritance. Again, raise your hand if you need it. You make those decisions. Prayer partners, go to where people are. Amen. Church, stand up. Let's rejoice in what the Lord is doing as we advance forward in him. Oh, Jesus.